Wait, what just happened? Where did Jeff's beard go? Why is he wearing a hat? What's with the crazy change in image and sound quality? There was like a fog over the video for fallacies. What is this? Those are diagnostic questions, so corny. Whenever we have an issue that happens in the world and we ask ourselves what happened, what caused that, what's going on here, we are dealing with, of course, explanations. We will handle explanations as diagnostics. If you've ever seen the show House, I'll refer to that a few times, that's the classic diagnostic problem. Something is wrong, we're trying to figure out the causal story so we know what to do about it. Why won't my hair grow back? Well, where are my car keys? Who killed that person? We're asking for the causal diagnostic story. Now, how it usually happens, this means we're, go we're doing a cause effect sort of story, but we're going from seen effects to try to figure out what the unseen causes are. So let's start corny, give you more chances to make fun of me. So let's say that you look outside, you look out your window of the classroom, let's say, and you see a tree doing this. Now, you can't see what's causing the tree to move. You can only see the effects of something. And so right away in your head, you might ask, what's causing the tree to sway? This is what we'll call the implicit question. What does that mean? It means that you see evidence in the world that is implying there needs to be something to explain it. There is some sort of mystery. And so you ask a question to find out how to solve the mystery, to answer the implicit question. We will call it IQ for short, the implicit question. Now, in an ordinary sort of case like that, you would say, what is causing the tree to sway a little bit? And the obvious explanation, the obvious answer to the question is a little wind. Fine. Now, the way this works is again relying on Gus. And the issue is, are you familiar enough with those effects to be confident that you're giving the most likely explanation? Now notice how this works. If you were to come back the next day and you would see the tree, say, moving this much. Oh, there it is, right? Really move it around. Now notice, the effects aren't that different than what you saw on that earlier day. So what do you assume? a very similar cause. That's because your Gus has experience in both of these kinds of cases. And so you can extrapolate from a small wind to the new case. What do we have? What's causing the tree to sway? A larger wind, a stiffer wind, and we'd be very confident. Now, if you're doing good diagnostics, you have to consider other cases as well to make sure you're not overlooking what we'll call rivals. In house, they would call these differential diagnoses. Nice, that's totally fine. We will call them rivals for short. What are they doing? They are rival or competing explanations. Okay, so now let me show you the importance of Gus. If you are looking out the window on a third day, or let's say you're watching TV and you see a tree doing this, now notice, maybe that's something you haven't seen before in person. But notice, because of the behavior, you can easily extrapolate. Now, what is the implicit question? What is causing the tree to sway violently? But you have an easy, Gus-ready answer. Very strong wind, a hurricane, a typhoon, or whatever you'd want to say. Fine. Now, let me show you how important Gus is. What if you look out the window, and this time you see a tree doing this? Now, watch. Here's my tree. Yes, I'm weird. And this time the tree is doing this. Do you see it? Now, physically, that's not much different than the earlier case, but you would still say, oh my gosh, the rivals are no longer obvious. Because the behavior is slightly different. Now, what's the key? The key isn't the behavior is different. The key is that you don't have relevant gusts. You don't have a background of experiences with cases like that. Now notice, it's doing some really sort of odd movements. Not the kind of random but all in one direction that you would see from, from wind. And so now, notice, your rival explanations lack confidence. Because now you have to consider, okay, there's somebody moving the tree. There is a gopher conspiracy and they're trying to dislodge that tree. Um, now what else do you consider? 
Uh, maybe I'm hallucinating. Trees don't do that. Notice, could there still be a wind rival? Sure, but it would be a really strange wind. It would be something that gusts and then stops and then switches directions. I mean, I guess the eye of a storm could be like that or something. But notice, you're no longer confident in your rivals. Why? Because you don't have relevant experience. So try a different diagnostic case. Uh, let's say that I have some juice in the fridge and I'm thirsty and I go to get some of the juice and it's gone. Common sort of diagnostic problem. What is the IQ? What is the implicit question? What happened to my juice? Now notice, we want to be general enough. We don't want to automatically say, who stole my juice? Because it might be a different story. It might be someone moved it. Or maybe I have it still and I just forgot I put it in a different place or something. So we don't want to jump to conclusions, so we leave our IQ general, making sure that all the different stories we could imagine would still be a clear answer to that question. So I ask more generally, why is my juice missing? Why is it my juice on the shelf where it should be? Fine. Now notice, immediately in your brain, you ask the implicit question and rivals jump into your brain really quick. This is the key idea. Questions, the implicit question, answers are your rivals. So what do we say? Oh, uh, my son stole the juice. My wife took the juice. Uh, maybe I drank it and forgot. And so there is no more juice and I threw it away or recycled the, the container. And we're working on this. And so what can we do? Look around for evidence. I could check the recycle bin. That would tell me if I drank it because that's where I put it. I ask around, anybody drink my juice? Fine. What am I doing? I am trying to answer my question by providing the causal story. What is the cause, the unseen cause, that is producing these effects? This is what explanations usually are. And now we can treat it as an argument. I'll show you. We will set it up as an argument. And what is it? It's what's called an, the inference to the best explanation. Now, an inference is just giving logical support. Remember when we were talking about how to distinguish between inductive and deductive arguments, and I said the inference is very different. What is the move from the evidence to the conclusion? Well, that's what this, that's what this is. The difference here is all the work happens in your conclusions. Notice I said plural. To do a good diagnostic argument, you must have multiple rival conclusions that are trying to do what? Explain the evidence. So go back to my case. So if we simply have some missing juice, we would we, that would lead our brain to all these normal rivals based on the experiences we're used to. Maybe your family never steals juice, so you can rule that one out as fairly unlikely. But my son, my wife steal juice constantly, so those are going to the top of the stack of rival competing explanations for me, and so I can start to fill this in. So let's look at this. So here, let me show you a little diagram of how we'll set this up. We'll start with the implicit question at the top. There it is, the IQ. What happened to my juice? Where is my juice? Why is it missing? All of those are good questions that leave open all the possible answers. Then. Your brain will immediately start to think of rivals. It won't wait to lay out the evidence. It will jump to rivals. And so feel free to let your brain say these. Don't forget any. And we'll label these as C subscript 1, C subscript 2, C subscript 3 to make them easy to refer to. So C1, my son stole the juice. C2, wifey stole the juice. C3, I drank it but forgot and put it and put the jar the bottle away. And we can keep going. See. Now notice what the key structure is. Question, answer, and your rivals. Now, when we're being very careful and we don't have an immediate explanation we really like, we're gonna set this up as a diagnostic explanation or a diagnostic argument. And so now we would start to fill in what in arguments are called the premises. Not too different here. The premises are simply the evidence. And so what is the obvious key piece of evidence? My juice is gone. Now, we start to think of all the other evidence in this case because this could play a role in how we explain it. 
how we answer the question and explain the key piece of evidence. What else could we say? I had juice in there yesterday. Clear. The juice was on this top shelf to the right where I usually keep it. My wife often takes my juice. My son often asks for my juice and sometimes takes it. And we could go on and on because how much evidence could there be? Tons. There is actually infinite evidence in any diagnostic case. It could be relevant what day of the week it is, what month it is, what season it is, what direction the refrigerator is facing, what is the astrological sign of my son, who knows? My, my wife's criminal history of stealing my juice, we can get into the details of that. Does she usually steal at night or in the morning? That could all be this evidence. But notice in most cases we're pretty good at knowing what sort of evidence will be relevant or not. All right, just to get you used to the apparatus, let's look at another example. Uh, right now I'm recording this in October, so Thanksgiving's coming up, right? So let's try this one. Uncle Mike and Aunt Sue get sick. Now, what's the implicit question? The implicit question is, why are Sue and Mike sick? Obvious. Now, we can, there is the question answers and rivals immediately start coming into our head and so we would say food poisoning uh they have a virus maybe they have covid and we would start labeling all the evidence sue got sick mike got sick and we'd start expressing the details of their illness do they have a headache do they feel nauseous do they have diarrhea sorry i don't like that word and we would go down and list the evidence now you see the apparatus here, I'm using this case just to point out two common things that we look for in evidence. V these are two things that are in your guts. I'm just going to give you words for them. One is called the common thread. What do we look for in evidence? If there is more than one instance, right here, two people got sick. If you think of the juice case, let's say this has happened twice over the last couple weeks. Well, what am I looking for? What is the common thread between the two cases? So, what do Mike and Sue have in common that might help us explain what the problem is? Did they eat the gravy after it had been sitting out for two hours? Did both of them drink too much eggnog or something? We're looking for a common thread. In the juice case, we would say, is there something similar about the two days that my juice was missing? What else are we looking for? a relevant difference. Because Sue and Mike are the only ones that got sick, we want to ask another sort of sub-question and ask, what did they do different than the other people who didn't get sick? What is the relevant difference between those who got sick and those who didn't? And so notice, if it turns out that they are the only ones that had the gravy after it was sitting out for an hour, now we have a rival that's starting to gain in likelihood over the other possible rivals. All right, again, just getting used to the language and the apparatus. All right, please humor me for a second and let's talk about a broader philosophical issue when it comes to explanations because the average person has completely misguided ideas about what it means to give the best explanation. Remember, we're dealing with these as arguments for the best explanation. A first most basic and less traumatic for me problem is the way people talk about explanations. People talk about explanations as if they are regular sorts of arguments. And then they use words like, this explanation has the most support and we need to support this conclusion. Now notice, if you're working for a police department and you're trying to solve a crime, you never want to have an approach where I think it was so-and-so, and now let's find support for that explanation. No, that is going the wrong direction. You are letting too much bias creep in if you think of these explanations needing support. There is, let's say, a dead body. The dead body isn't doing anything. It's not trying to support a certain answer for why that, body was, what that person was killed. So you always want to think of, now notice, in arguments, we talk about support going down, that support, the evidence supports a conclusion. Because you notice you are trying to provide evidence to make your conclusion more likely. 
that's standard. I mean, these are all inductive arguments. But you don't want to think of diagnoses or explanations in that way. You want to think of the evidence as simply sitting there. And yes, you may, may, may need to look at it again and again and look for more and more evidence. But the work is in providing the right explanation. So explanations work up to the evidence. You are trying to craft the exact right explanation to explain the key pieces of evidence. Do not think of this as, I need to find evidence that supports my explanation that will screw things up, and it often does. Now that leads to the broader problem, and this is also a problem with the way people understand science. Even scientists usually get this thing, they misconstrue how it works. So first, when we talk about having the explanation for something, most often our assuredness is still a likelihood issue. Now, of course, if we find, oh, there's the video showing who killed the person, and we can find the seen cause at that, at that point, it's not usually that way. We're still extrapolating to unseen causes. But here's the issue. If we think of explanations or these different rival conclusions, rival explanations, as running a race to be what we call the explanation, to where we feel like we've solved the case, we've answered the implicit question, we have the explanation. Notice how it really looks. If this, let me use my corny drawings, if the finish line is being the explanation or the best explanation, notice some people think the explanation is the rival that has the most evidence for it. No. If you have a case that looks, say, like this, there is C1, and it is almost explaining every single detail of evidence, and it explains a little more evidence than C2, and then C1, C4, C5, all these other rivals, there could be tons of them, don't explain as much evidence. We wouldn't, that in that case, say the one that's the closest to the finish line is the explanation. Now, don't get me wrong. Even if that best explanation was even closer to the finish line, meaning it explains just about every piece of evidence we've been able to find, notice, it still is not the explanation. Being the explanation is not a matter of explaining the most evidence or explaining it in the most likely way. So, if you had this case where these two explanations are really close, you wouldn't say one is better than the other until you look enough at the evidence and rule the other one out so that this one explanation is superior to all the others. Even if it still has some issues it can't explain, the issue is does it outcompete the rivals to where they are trailing far behind? And we don't say we have the best explanation until we have a picture that looks like that. A picture that looks like this is much better than all the rivals that we could consider. So notice, the work isn't just in here is the evidence and it fits it. It's in coming up with rivals that can compete for the explanation. And this is how science works as well. We don't simply have, this explains it, we have, this explains it better than anything else. All right, all right, thanks, right? You probably skipped over that part. All right, so let's just do the practice of setting up the diagnostic. So look at the exercises for this, for this content. What we need to do is first, State the implicit question. If it's directly stated, great. Otherwise, you know, state it really clearly. What is the question? Then give the author's rival answer to the implicit question. And then, just to get you used to this mindset, try to come up with some competing rivals of your own. You can probably do much better than the ones the authors are suggesting here. All right, so example A. I'll tell you what caused all these cases of kids shooting up their schools. Every single one of those kids like to play violent video games. So notice we need the implicit question. Easy, what is the cause of these school shootings? Or why do kids shoot up their schools? What causes all these school shootings? Anyway, general enough. You are not hinting at the answer. The question is broad enough where all possible answers could be included. And what is the author's suggested rival? Every single one of those kids like to play violent video games or shorthand, 
violent video games caused the school shooting. So we'll call that C1. Now, notice. We'll talk about correlations a little bit, but what we've got is a correlation story. Is there a correlation, to be careful, a correlation simply says two things occur together in some conspicuous way. Conspicuous meaning it's a noticeable way. They either occur together often or they occur together in such a strange thing, like this thing happens which is rare at the same time as this thing happens which is also rare. And so you would say, ooh, they probably have something to do with each other. Or, like smoke and fire, you would say, oh, whenever I see one, I see the other, so they must go together. But a correlation is simply talking about these two events occur together in some way. It doesn't mean they cause each other, because it could be a coincidence. Fine. In this case, we have the author looking at a correlation. Is there a correlation between kids who shoot up their schools and kids who play violent video games? Yes, there is. Does that make it a good explanation, though? No, because almost every kid plays violent video games, so there isn't, notice what we said before about Thanksgiving, there isn't a relevant difference between the kids who shoot up their schools and don't. They all play violent video games. So terrible. So come up with some better rivals of your own. What do you got? Uh, peer pressure, uh, violence in the society. Yeah, what about the fact that our country is always at war killing people in foreign countries? Do you ever think of that as a possible reason? These kids are just doing what their military heroes do. They're just hitting the wrong targets, right? C civilians in the United States instead of civilians in another country. Okay, that was way over the top. So sorry. Uh, what are other explanations? Um, mental health problems with the kids? You'll find that is quite common in a lot of these school shootings. And not just basic mental health problems, but sociopathy, right? Some of these kids are sociopaths. Um, bad parenting, um, bullying. Now, what do you really see? I mean, here, let's get deep. It used, there used to be this theory that people with low self-esteem are prone to violence. That's actually fairly uncommon. It is the people that have inflated but fragile self-esteem that are the most prone to violence. If I think I am the greatest person ever, the most handsome and the best at basketball, and I'm really not, and somebody says that I am not, I am going to attack and be aggressive because I have an inflated sense of how important I am. Cough, cough, our last president. Cough, cough, cough. You, know, you get the idea. These are a lot of the violence associated with sorry, Trump, January 6th, are people with inflated self-esteem who feel diminished or offended by what other people are doing. That's when people act aggressive. If I feel like I deserve a ton of respect and I don't get it, and right, I'm fragile in that way because I probably don't deserve it, I'm going to get aggressive because the world is not appreciating me enough. You get it. Anyway, a lot of better rivals than violent video games. Example B. Oh, sorry. And so notice, if we were to fill in the evidence and full, put a, a, do a full diagnostic, what is the evidence? Well, the evidence is school shooters play violent video games. That's the only evidence the author is looking at. That is evidence. And so the author thinks that that is the best rival as well. What is the rival? Violent video games cause the school shootings. Got it. B. So many Americans buy luxury items, whether they can afford them or not. They see that top executives wear expensive clothes and drive nice cars. They do the same, thinking that projecting an image of success is a key to being successful. Yes, I'm picking on every cliche in American weird society. Fake it till you make it. Dress for the job you want, not the job you have. All this stuff. So, what is the question? Why do Americans buy luxury items even when they can't afford them? Why? The author's rival? Because they think that looking successful will lead to being successful. Is that a good rival? No, it's terrible. What are better rivals? Uh, they are envious of rich people and so copy them. Uh, they are duped by advertising and to think that you should buy expensive things even if you can't afford them. Um, they are looking for respect through what they purchase because they can't find respect in their intelligence, choices, skills, actions, creativity. 
we have a lot of good explanations that are much better than projecting success will lead to success. No, everybody in America wants to look richer than they are. That's just a standard, you know, cult in our society. All right, C, another correlation question, right? So this is neat. Remember, there is a major difference between a correlation and an explanation. A correlation simply says two things occur together. That is very different than explaining why they occur together. Does one cause the other? Is there some third cause that leads to both? Is there a chain of causes that connects them? Just saying things occur together does not mean they cause one another. Cough, cough, autism, and childhood vaccines. Cough, cough. Do those things correlate? Yes, they correlate. Those things occur at the same time. The first symptoms of autism happen, what, at about the age of two, two and a half, and vaccines, the, the bulk of them are done by the age of two. So those things do have a coincidence of occurring together because of age, but they don't cause one another. Ugh, drives me nuts. C, women with boob jobs tend to die younger than women without boob jobs. This must be because the implants cause deadly infections. What is the implicit question? Why do women with boob jobs tend to die younger than women without? It's a correlation question. Why do these things go together? Mortality rates are higher with women with boob jobs. Fine. What is the author's rival conclusion? C1, implants cause deadly infections. Do you see it? That is not a very good rival. It's a very rare case that that causes someone to die. What is a better causal story than C1. Yes, I think you're getting it. Lifestyle causes both. Women who tend to get boob jobs tend to be, we could even say have low self-esteem or are in weird peer groups, but these are women that tend to take risks, more prone to, what, drive too fast, more prone to drink a lot, more prone to take drugs, uh, have a lifestyle that's Fairly dangerous, risky, craving attention, all of these things. And what is that? Lifestyle choices lead to boob jobs and also lead to riskier lifestyles that cause increased mortality. Do you get it? So at that time, the correlation is explained by a shared cause. Good? Got it. D. Now a big, huge case. Again, just getting you used to laying out the structure. The skull and one foot of a woman were discovered in her home by her nephew, authority said. This occurred next to a, a university I used to teach at. That's why I grabbed this story. We dug everywhere in the yard, but with the rain and everything, it's hard to locate anything, said Hammock, a San Bernardino County deputy coroner. Hammock said he believes Mary Hesse, a 61-year-old cancer patient, died naturally, and her body later was eaten by the dogs. There is no visible trauma to the skull and no indication of what caused her death. Now, Right there, notice how cases are reported. Her whole body is missing except her skull and a foot, and there's no indication of what caused her death. Do you get the idea? You know what he meant. Right. San Marino County Sheriff's deputies believe the woman died inside her home and was dragged outside by the dogs when they became hungry. The woman had been dead between three and four weeks before the remains were discovered Tuesday by her nephew. He said the dogs, described as medium-sized mongrels, looked in pretty good shape to me, not like they were starving or anything. I am so sorry, but that's kind of adorable, even though it's gross. You see what he's saying? He comes home. Where is Mary? All he can find is a skull and a foot, and the dogs look happy and healthy. All right. What is the author's rival? She died of natural causes and was drugged, uh, was drugged outside, and the dogs ate the body. It's actually a really good rival. But in order to make sure it's the best rival, we have to give it competition. So what could we say? Uh, the son staged the whole thing and he killed her, right? And that's the one that, oh, found her body. Sounds like a good TV show, but fairly unlikely. Uh, what is the other very likely rival? Maybe the dogs killed her because they got hungry or they were pissed off. Doesn't happen very often. Do dogs often kill their owners? No. But will dogs eat dead owners? Absolutely they will if there's no other food source. But so, 
main rivals seem to be the dogs killed her and then drug her outside and ate her body, or she died of natural causes and then they ate her body when they became hungry. Clear? Now what else does it say? Why is the author's rival really strong? It has other evidence that, that correlates really well. She's 61 years old. That's not that old, but she's a cancer patient. Sorry. It makes it fairly likely. Notice what's weird there too, though. We call dying of cancer dying of natural causes. A lot of cancers aren't natural. They're environmental, but you get the point. She wasn't murdered by dogs, died of cancer, ate her body, but you see the setup. And now notice, if we were doing a full diagnostic here, every little piece of evidence would go where the premises are. She's 61, she has cancer, they only found a skull, there was rain, and we'd go through all the details and see which rival best explains the most important evidence. Good. 